morning, everybody. It is time to begin our worship service. If you are visiting with us, you are our honored guest, and we are deeply appreciated to have you here. If you wouldn't mind filling out one of the green cards in the uh, bit in front of you, you can either leave it there or put it in the collection tray. And uh, if you guys wouldn't mind silencing any cell phones or noise-making devices so they do not disturb our worship, we would deeply appreciate it. Our sympathy is extended to the family and friends of Sister Sherilyn Hurd of the Easterridge Congregation in Cleveland. She worshiped with us here many times over the last few years. Her visitation and funeral will be at the Eastridge Church building, starting at East Side. Thank you for that, that would be a terrible mistake. Uh, East Side Church building, starting at 10.30 a.m. on Tuesday, August 16th. For our sicker in the hospital, Jeff Moore had a heart attack last night and had emergency surgery to place a stint. He is in the ICU at Memorial. Lisa Paris requests prayers for Tyler Perhater. He is having some serious health issues. Ryan McCard requests prayers for his sister, Sarah. She's experiencing, expecting her second child and having some health problems. And if you would please see our bulletin board uh, back there, we have several different health issues and prayer requests that are not mentioned here. For our general announcements, uh, a thank you to all who contributed to the school supplies. Uh, these supplies will help many students at the East Ridge Elementary. Martin Boyd has invited us to conduct worship services there in the month of August, as long as they remain free of COVID cases. Worship time will be 3 p.m. on Sundays, with Bible study at 2 p.m. on Wednesdays. Everyone is invited to participate in the service today. The next term of Chattanooga School of Preaching and Biblical Studies it begins on August 22nd. The classes will be Joshua, Judges, Ruth, Denominational Doctrine, and Isaiah. Concerning our order of service, first prayer will be Josh Perry, closing prayer will be Jim Lewis, scripture reading will be Patton Garrett and Micah Perry, and Brother Hal Hunt will be leading us in song. Begin this morning by singing number two. Number two, a wonderful sight.
us pray. Dear God, we are so thankful to have this time, this morning, this beautiful morning that you've given us to come together in freedom, to come together in freedom and worship in your name, to read your word, to study it, and to gain that knowledge. We ask that our efforts here uh, this morning be ones that are uh, along with your word, that are, that are righteous acts, that are things that uh, you would be proud of us for. And we ask that you uh, be with us and help us to uh, keep our minds trained on the things that we are doing and not to be distracted by things of the world, that uh, we are here to worship you and to gain knowledge so we can teach others. We ask that you uh, be with our, uh, our minds as we sing and our praise to you, that we concentrate on those words. And when the time comes to partake of the Lord's Supper, that we also take that very seriously and uh, we know that it is in the remembrance of you and the, the acts that your son did and we are so glad that he sacrificed himself for us so that we could have forgiveness of sins. Just be with us and help us to always uh, be a good example to others and to do for others before we do for ourselves and to make you the center of our lives. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. We prepare to partake of the Lord's Supper. Let's sing number 257. 257. like to join me before the Lord's Supper, I'll be reading from the book of Mark, the book of Mark, chapter 10, and I'll begin reading in verse 32, and they were in the way going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus went before them, and they were amazed, and as they followed, they were afraid, and he took again the twelve, and began to tell them things, that, what things should happen unto him, saying, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be delivered 
unto the chief priest and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles. And they shall mock him, and shall scourge him, and shall spit upon him, and shall kill him, and the third day he shall rise again. Thank you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful to gather around this table. Father, that we partake of the bread that is an emblem of the body that was given for us on the cross of Calvary. Father, we ask you'll be with those who partake and that will do so in a manner well-pleasing in thy sight. Forgive us of our sins. In Christ's name, amen. Let us pray. In like manner, dear Heavenly Father, we offer our thanks for this cup, this fruit of the vine, which represents Christ's blood that was shed upon the cross. We're thankful for the forgiveness of sins that that brings to us, and as we reflect upon that sacrifice, we pray that we do it in a pleasing manner. In Christ's name we pray.
Scripture reading will be from the book of Mark, the book of Mark, chapter 10, starting with verse 17. Now, as he was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him, and asked, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. And he answered and said to him, Teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, One thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven. And come, take up the cross, and follow me. But he was sad at this word, and went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Fathers, we prepare to give back a portion of that which you so richly bless us with. Father, let us do so not grudgingly or out of necessity, but for the love of the gospel and the spreading of it. Father, we ask you bless those who are about to forgive and continue to bless this church. In Christ's name, amen. You're using one of the hymnals and would like to mark the invitation song. That will be number 313. 313 following the lesson this morning. Now let's stand together and sing number 263. 263. Sing the mother of God to me.
Again, we'd like to echo the sentiments that Brother Joshua expressed. If you're visiting with us this morning, we're thankful that you're here. We see some familiar visitors. Uh, Donna and I have got a couple of new visitors with us this morning. We've got Asmana and we've got Clay. Uh, they used to be neighbors of Jimenez and Angelina, and recently their mothers hooked up, and so they're here with us today, and we hope you'll get to meet them. If someone is the mayor of a city, president of a country, principal of a school, shift manager at a place of business, those folks are expected to take responsibility for their actions. They're held accountable. Now, why is that? Well, number one, because those positions or roles which I just mentioned, those are positions of authority. But number two, they're adults. And we expect adults to take responsibility for their actions. Now, with the little kids, uh, not so much. Here's a little three-year-old fella and at his house, they got this fireplace, and it's real wood, and it's real fire. And he's seen his dad on a couple of occasions grab something and fall on the floor and just throw it into the fire to burn it up. Well, one day, he sees there's this piece of paper laying on the table, and he just wants to be like Daddy. And he takes that piece of paper, and he throws it in the fire, and it burns up. Oh, yo. That was the title to his dad's brand new truck. Now, the little guy, he may get some discipline, but we don't hold him accountable like we would someone who was 23 instead of three. But the news for all of us is that the God of heaven holds all of us accountable for the choices that we make and the actions that we take. We're all going to stand before the judgment seat of his son and give an account of the things that we've done. And so in our lesson today, we want to talk about learning to take responsibility for my actions. I can't speak for anybody else and no one else can speak on my behalf. But it's up to us as individuals to take responsibility for our actions, whether those actions are good, bad, or neutral. Well, let's begin by stating the obvious. Actions have consequences. Well, that's true in every aspect of life. Now, perhaps you go to or went to a public school. Perhaps you were or are now a student in a private school, or perhaps you were or are now homeschooled. Well, somewhere along the line, you probably had a science class in which you had some liquid inside of a beaker or container, a test tube, and the experiment was, we're gonna take some outside material or object and add that to the liquid. We're well, gonna get some consequences. It may be that you slosh it around and it, it, slosh, it, it was clear, but now it becomes pink. And so you're supposed to write down all of your observations. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sounding, it's right, right? Or maybe you add a certain element and you get a boom. You get an explosion. Or in some cases, you, you, you add the right stuff and you get a stench. <laughs> Actions have consequences. When we're distracted as a driver, whether we're 15 or 85, distractions, you know what they are? They're distracting. <laughs> Whether it's the phone rings and we want to take a glance and see who it is, or we're trying to change the, the radio station, or somebody says something, we look at distractions, they have consequences. When we think about things in life and actions having consequences, I think you could categorize some of those things as being insignificant and the consequences are temporary. You may remember and you may not. 
40 years ago, one of our first meals in the Republic of China, we were staying as guests in the home of an American family who eventually became good friends. And back at that time, if you were gonna have a dessert, you were making it from scratch, okay? You, there weren't any such thing as mixes. And so our, our host, our hostess, she decided to make a pie. Now ladies, the recipe called for a certain amount of baking powder. Well, she didn't have any baking powder, but she had something that started with baking, and so she's substituting baking soda. Yuck. It was awful. But, you know, we, we had a good laugh then, and, uh, and I've at least had a good laugh through the years, not with her, but when I've thought about that. It, it was something that, it had consequences, but in, in the big scheme of things, it, it really didn't matter. But other choices we make in life, other things we do, they can have more serious, long-lasting, maybe even permanent consequences. Individuals who smoke or, or use tobacco in other forms or uh, take in alcohol, that's, that's gonna have some, some consequences on their health. They might, might find themselves at a later stage of life where they their lungs are severely damaged that they have trouble breathing. They're gonna find that their liver has been so damaged they've got serious issues. So, so, so that's an action or choice that can have longer lasting serious consequences. And then there are some choices, some actions that have eternal consequences. Not only in this life are there consequences, but there are consequences in the world to come. We think about Galatians 6 and verse 7. God, God is not mocked. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And the next verse says, He that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap everlasting corruption. Life. And so I think one of the takeaways is, as much as possible, what we try to do in life, and we don't always do it well, what we learn and what we try to do in life is before we open our mouths to speak, and before we take action, it sure turns out a whole lot better if we will think it through before we open our mouths and we think it through and consider the consequences before we take action. So actions have consequences. Now, sometimes individuals, rather than stepping up and taking responsibility for what they've done, they point a finger at someone else. Turn with me, if you'd like, to the book of Exodus, chapter 32. And as you're turning there, I'll just make reference to the first case in human history that we have of somebody pointing a finger at someone else actually took place in the Garden of Eden. After Eve and Adam had eaten of the fruit about which God had said, you're not to eat that stuff, God asked them, he said, Adam, have you all taken from that tree and eaten of that? I told you not to eat. And Adam said, well, the woman that you gave me, she gave me the fruit and I ate it. So Adam was the first husband in history who was pointing a finger at his wife for his miscue. And then as God moved to Eve, basically the question was, and what about you, ma'am? She said, well, hey, that, that serpent, the serpent beguiled me. And so there, right out of the gate, so to speak, in human history, what percentage of humanity was involved in making excuses and pointing a finger? 100%. <laughs> so we have that case in Genesis 3, verses 11 to 13. Well, the case here in Exodus 32 is Moses had gone up onto the top of Mount Sinai to speak with God, and down below the people got, well, whatever. And they told Aaron, make us a god. And so they did, they made a golden calf. And so let's read beginning in verse 21, what Moses said, verse 21. 
And Moses said unto Aaron, What did this people unto thee that thou brought so great a sin upon them? And Aaron said, Let not the anger of my Lord wax hot. Thou knowest the people that they are set on mischief. For they said unto me, Make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we water know not what has become of him. And so here's Aaron, the older brother Moses. And Moses said, big brother, you sinned. He said, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute now. The people, the people, it was their idea. Here Aaron was, the first high priest of Israel. He had an opportunity to own his mistake, but instead he pointed a finger at the people. The next one on the screen, 1 Samuel 15, involves the first human king of Israel. And that first human king of Israel was a man by the name of Saul. And God had given instruction to Saul. He said, I want you to go and utterly destroy the Amalekites. You destroy the people, you wipe out the people, and you wipe out all the animals. Well, after God sent him on that mission, the prophet Samuel went down there to meet up with Saul. Verse number 13, 1 Samuel 15, verse 13. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, What meaneth then this bleating of the sheep in mine ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? And Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites. For the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. What are you doing, king? Well, I'm refusing to take responsibility for my failure. I'm pointing a finger at the people. And then we drop down and we look at verse number 20. And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and have gone the way which the Lord sent me. And have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took of the spoil, and they did this and they did that. So here is a very clear case again, the third case we've mentioned in the Old Testament, where someone made a mistake and refused to take responsibility for their actions. Somebody said, well, look, he started it. He's the one that got it going. Now, that, that could have a couple of applications. Perhaps it was a squabble that led to fisticuffs. Well, why'd you hit him? Well, he hit me first. He started it. Or maybe it's not they get into it with one another, but they arrive at this convenience store and and, and he says he's shoplifted five times and never been caught. And so he said, hey, let's give it a try. And so he started it and I went with him and I got caught and that's not fair. He's done it six times and never been caught. That's not fair. Well, that's a failure to take responsibility for choices made and actions taken. Well, Brother Roger, the the devil is so strong. There are some cases where I just, I don't have any control over it, and he just takes over, and, and I just, no, no, no. The Bible says that we are to resist the devil, and he will flee from us. James chapter 4 and verse number 7. And part of that armor of God is the shield of faith, Ephesians 6, 16, that we're to use to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one. Now, sometimes things are said that should not be said. And sometimes things are done that should not be done, and people get their feelings hurt. Hurt feelings, they're real. But that's a real experience for all of us. But here, let me tell you about Naomi. And the names have been changed. Let me tell you about Naomi. When Naomi was 18 years old, she she had grown up in a Christian home. 
never missed a Bible class, never missed a worship assembly of God. That's what her family did. But when Naomi was 18 years old, just graduated from high school, someone in the foyer at the church building said something about her family that was, not only was it not nice, it wasn't true. And Naomi got her feelings hurt. And she decided she's done with the church. Now, Naomi's 38 years old. That was 20 years ago. Naomi had about 10 options within 30 minutes where she could have gone to a sound congregation, but she's never gone. If I did my tabulating correctly, she's missed over 4,000, over 4,000 Bible classes and worship assemblies. And she said, I'll tell you the reason right now. I don't mind telling you, it's because of what they said 20 years ago. Now, in the beginning, her feelings may have been the key factor. But right now, the key factor is her faith, her lack of faith. No, ma'am, don't you dare think I'm dumb enough to think something happened 20 years ago, and that's why you're not attending services. You're not attending services. You're not active among God's people because you choose not to be. Naomi, you need to stand up and take responsibility for your actions. Let's think thirdly. What are, what are some other ways? It's not an exhaustive list, but what are some other ways? Sometimes people point a finger at someone else rather than take responsibility. What are some other ways that people kind of they try to excuse themselves or get around it? Well, sometimes they lie about what happened. Now, that's just a common thing in life. Whether you're talking about a kid sitting in the principal's office, player talking to a coach, or one of us on the job, or, or in, interacting with people in the family. That's a common thing for people to try to cover themselves by lying. You know, there are different kinds of witnesses. And the Bible, in a very succinct way, says in Proverbs 14, in verse number 5, a faithful witness will not lie, but a false witness will utter lies. And so there's what we might call a textbook definition of what it means to be a faithful witness or an unreliable witness. A faithful witness, what does he or she do? They step up and tell the truth. An unfaithful witness, no. They might tell the truth part of the time, but they're not going to be consistent in doing that. So, so we understand sometimes people try to cover their tracks by being uh, dishonest. Well, well, other people, look, mom, look, coach, look, teacher, look, boss, look, spouse. Other people are doing the same thing. I mean, how bad can it be? So other people are doing it. Well, what other people do is not the criteria for how God's people make their choices. God said to the children of Israel when they were at Mount Sinai, thou shalt not follow a multitude, the New King James says crowd, thou shalt not follow a multitude or crowd to do evil. So it doesn't matter what other people are doing, but, but people who say that, if, if you and I say that, it, it maybe soothes our conscience. It maybe makes us feel a little better about ourselves. Maybe it kind of lightens, we think lightens maybe perhaps the mistake that we've made. But look, if I could prove that everybody on Greens Lake Road and Bennett Road and John Ross, if I could go and stand in front of every house and say, you know, this person lives here, she's done this and he's done that. Let me ask you that. If I could prove that somebody else had done something wrong, how would that improve my relationship with the Lord? How would that remedy mistakes that I have made? And the answer is, it won't help my relationship with God. It doesn't remedy mistakes that I make. Well, here's one that we sometimes see in the church. Now, here's a brother, sister. They've been involved in immorality. 
Perhaps they've been unfaithful to the Lord for years and years and years. But at some point, they stop the immorality and they start doing better. They begin to do some things. Or maybe they, they've been away for years, even decades, and now they start coming to services. Well, let me ask you. Is coming to services better than staying away from services? You better believe it. Is staying out of immoral activities better than engaging in immoral activities? Yes, but time does not remedy the mistakes that have been made. I've even known a case where people have even verbalized, oh, they'll forget in time. I'm living in an adulterous situation. They'll forget in time. Before you know it, he's up there leading prayer for the congregation because they think, well, I'll just let it go and people forget about it. I mean, after all, Bub was doing a lot better. Give him credit. Well, it doesn't take care of it. Well, what needs to happen is those who have been away from the Lord need to stand up and take responsibility for their actions. This is a really long statement, isn't it? If I'm mature enough to serve the Lord, then I'm old enough to take responsibility for my actions. You know, sometimes the question comes up, it's a really practical question. Well, how old does a person have to be before they can become a Christian? You reckon she's old enough? You reckon he's old enough? Well, there's more than understanding the Bible answer to the question, what's the purpose of water baptism? Is that person at that age ready to step up and take responsibility for their actions? Is that person at that age capable of carrying out their responsibilities to other people? You don't know, there are some people who never seem to grow up. Now, biologically, you look at their birth certificate, they are a biological adult. But when it comes to their maturity in life, it's never their fault. It's never their fault. It's the government's fault. It's the school's fault. It's the boss's fault. It's the spouse's fault. It's the neighbor's fault. It's the friend's fault. It's always somebody else's fault. You know, sometimes, you know, here is a boy, it's not, it's not a sinful matter, okay, so relax. But here's a boy, and he's playing middle school football. And he plays receiver. I'm talking about Americano football here, okay? He plays receiver, which the principle is, in theory, somebody passes him the football, and he catches it. Receiver. Well, some have what we call better hands than others. Some are more skilled at catching. Look, things happen that prevent receivers from catching the ball like you'd hope they would. But now, some folks, anytime they drop a pass, they've always got an excuse. Well, the ball was wet. I mean, sometimes the ball is wet. Well, the sun was in my eyes. Yes, sometimes the sun was in my eyes. Well, the lights were bright. Yes, sometimes the lights were bright. I wasn't looking, it was too hard. Sometimes that happens. Well, I tripped, got caught in my, some, but every time Tommy doesn't catch the ball, there's always an excuse. Well, that, that's a small deal in life. But when it comes to our actions that are pleasing or not pleasing in God's sight, we need to be ready to step up and take responsibility. I think about a man by the name of David in Psalm 32. I want to talk about David owning his mistakes. Now, when you, when you study the life of David, you, you, you study about a man who was righteous in, in, in many of his choices. And then at other times, he makes choices that are, that are far from that. But one of the things about David was when David messed up, he didn't try to cover up, he didn't try to hide it, didn't try to run away from it, didn't try to point a finger at somebody else. In our language, when David messed up, he owned it. Look in your Bible in Psalm 32. And he makes this observation, verse 32. Blessed is the man, I mean, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Now that's, that's, a, that's a general statement. 
no specific person in mind, but blessed is the person, happy is the person who, although they've committed sin, have had that sin covered up. It's been forgiven. Now, drop down to verse 5, and let's see the personal pronouns here that David uses. I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. David, who committed these sins about what you're speaking? I did. David, who owned those sins? I did. And so here's an example from which I can learn. Not to learn to take the action David did in committing the sin, but to see his spirit of contriteness and making this right with God. In 1 Chronicles 21, 1 Chronicles 21, I just have to ask, when's the last time you heard a verse read from 1 Chronicles 21? Okay. Here's a record of David as king. He counted the soldiers. He's supposed to be counting soldiers. God told Moses to count the soldiers when they're at Mount Sinai. He told Moses later to count the soldiers before we went in the land of Canaan. Well, something was off here. Okay? Something was off about this, but in the end, David recognized he'd messed up. And I want to read in 1 Chronicles 21, um, verse number 7. Start in verse 7. And God was displeased with this thing, therefore he smote Israel. And David said unto God, I have sinned greatly. Because I have done this thing, but now I beseech thee, do away with the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. David, did you do it? Yes. Was it wise? It was foolish. What do you call it, David? Did you just call it, well, a little mistake? He said, I sinned. You know what David did? He owned it. He's not boasting about it, but he has the right response to his mistakes. He took responsibility for it. And we'll not turn and read the verses, but in the, in the New Testament, we read about the Apostle Paul reflecting on his past. Paul had no doubts that the Lord had forgiven him for his past sins. Paul, known as Saul of Tarsus, had persecuted the church. And he knew that when he obeyed the gospel, the blood of Jesus washed away his sins. But in his mind, Paul often thought about his past. In 1 Corinthians 15, 9, he said, I'm, I'm not worthy to be an apostle. Why, Paul? Because I persecuted the church of God. And then in chapter 9 and 27, he said, when I'm preaching to others, he said, I have to discipline myself. I have to buffet my body, lest when I'm preaching to others, I should become a castaway or I become disqualified. What are you doing, Paul? I'm owning my choices, and I'm owning my mistakes. And so David and Paul are two Bible characters, not perfect in any sense of the word, but they're people who stepped up, they manned up to take responsibility for their choices and the actions which they took. Now, as a child of God, you and I living under the new covenant, if we've sinned against God, then we need to come before his throne of grace and mercy and confess our sins, and in some cases, confess our faults one to another, James 5 and verse 16. Somebody says, that's, 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 that's sticky. That's embarrassing. I can tell you from experience, it's really embarrassing to stand before an assembly in which you have teenage children and say to God and man, I, I shouldn't have done that. And I apologize. But you know what? God's people are forgiving people. And when we see a brother or sister who turns away from their sin in repentance and make confession of that sin, we are there either with a verbal or a literal hug or both and express our love and our forgiveness and let's just move on and work together, taking responsibility for our actions. Well, in order to take responsibility for our actions, what do I need? Well, I need integrity. I need to own it. Look. 
If I'm the one who broke the cup, I need to admit it. You know, some of us, Brother Danny, we grew up on a farm. And you know, on a farm, there's a, there's a lot expected of everybody in the family. And there's a lot of things that can happen on the farm where somebody just didn't do their job. Dad and mom are out of town for a couple of days and they get home and say, well, did you remember to feed the cattle in the morning and the evening? Well, I got busy. I was there. Uh, no, no, sir, I didn't. That's, there's going to be consequences. You're not feeding the cattle. And then the next thing you know, dad drives down the road and the cattle are not inside the, the field. They're, they're, they're where? They're not inside the pasture. They're out on the road. Who forgot to close the gate? <laughs> I did. Hey, you got done plowing the north 40? Did you grease the plowshares? You put grease on them, thick grease so they won't rust. No. Go out there and do it. Dad, it's 1030 at night. Go grease the plowshares. Okay? So integrity, own it. A contrite spirit is a sense of regret, meekness, and sorry for what we've done. And then there's humility. And then there's courage from, that comes from, we're going to need those things if we're going to take responsibility for our actions. Now, let, let's just talk about some specific things here. If I'm a Christian, if I'm old enough to be a Christian, if I'm mature enough to be a Christian, then that means I have the mental capacity and the desire to do what's expected of me regardless of what my age is. I need to be a responsible person in every aspect of life. Whether you're talking about sweeping out the garage, taking care of a bulletin board at school, whatever aspect of life. The Bible says in Colossians 3 and verse 23, whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men. Give it our best. And again, there's that principle of Luke 16, 10. The master said, if we're faithful in that which is little, then we'll be faithful in that which is much. And if we're not faithful with a little task, we won't be faithful in a bigger task. So acquire that trait. Acquire that habit now, regardless of your age. Whether you're three or 53, whatever your age is. Become a responsible, reliable, dependable person in every aspect of life. You will be blessed by it. I'm not talking about financial benefits, although there could be some. But you'll be blessed by having that character trait. If you're old enough to be a Christian, you shouldn't need dad and mom reminding you 10 times a week, hey, did you study your Bible? Did you take time to pray? You, you shouldn't need the elders sending out a, a text message or a message by phone to all the congregation every day saying, don't forget to study your Bible and pray. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 2, as newborn babes that de desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. If I'm mature enough to be a Christian, then I ought to be able to take on the task. Not very difficult to pray and study my Bible on a regular basis. If I'm old enough to be a Christian, I don't need somebody to make an announcement for me to go and visit people. Someone years ago used this terminology with me, and it stuck, and I think it's a pretty good description. He said, in my mind, the definition of a mature Christian is... It's someone who is a self-starter. Well, I think that's part of it. A self-starter is someone that doesn't need somebody, in our language, hounding them, always talking to them. If, if I'm a Christian, then that's part of my life, is visiting people who are shut in, taking care of the needs of widows, and, and making contact with those folks who may have some difficulty or some need. Not, not because I'm part of a visitation group. That, that's, that could be part of it. But just take the initiative to do that. One another responsibilities. Care for one another. Serve one another. Comfort 
one another. Love one another. Edify one another. Pray for one another. Exhort one another. All of those factors, that's that's part of being a child of the living God. And if I'm a mature person, then I need to take responsibility and do that. You say, well, not not many people are doing that. What's that got to do with my responsibility? Well, I know so-and-so, and and they've not done that for, they said themselves, they probably haven't done that for eight or ten years. What's that have to do with my responsibility? It has nothing to do with me. If I'm a follower of Jesus, I need to step up and do what I need to do regardless of what anyone else does. And if I'm old enough to be a Christian, then I'm old enough to get myself up and get myself psyched up to get to Bible class and worship and not be a detriment to other members of my family. It's part of growing. So, well, he, he, she's only 14. Is she old enough to be a Christian? Then she ought to be mature enough to get herself physically and mentally ready to go. Yeah. David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord, Psalm 122 and verse number one. So, Learning to take responsibility for my actions. The Bible says, so then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. The Bible says it. That settles it. Now and it's time for us to take that into account. Perhaps you're here today as a child of the living God and you need the prayers of the church. If you'll let that be known, we'll pray with you and pray for you that your sins can be washed away by the blood of the Lamb, or maybe you're here and you've never become a Christian. The way of salvation is through Jesus. The blood that he shed on the cross of Calvary can wash away every sin that any person has ever committed. We need to believe that he's the Son of God. Jesus said, if you believe not that I'm he, you should die in your sins, John 8 and verse number 24. The Bible says that God commanded all men everywhere to repent Acts 17 and verse 30, so there's got to be repentance. That traveler from Africa, when they came to water, he said, see here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We need to make that confession. And then be immersed in water for the remission of sin. It'll be the end of the old life, beginning of the best part of a new life. If you're subject to God's invitation, would you come as you stand and we sing?
lead us in this in prayer. Go Father in heaven, we are so grateful that you grant unto us the great and wonderful privilege to come and to gather as your children, to worship thee as we have done this day. We ask your continued blessing to be upon us, to look down in your kindness and strengthen us, O God, and give us the courage always to stand for that which is right in your sight. As we bring our worship unto thee to a close today, O God, at this time, again we would ask you to be mindful of the precious brethren who live in the country of Ukraine and the citizens there in that country, that you'd watch over them and bless them. Ask your special blessing to be with Sister Natasha's mother and her brother and her family, for the Sister Gay Boyka and his family, and all the Christians throughout that great land. Our prayer is that you remove the enemy, the evil from that land, that the doors of the gospel might be opened once again in a good fashion, and that you would look at your kindness toward them in every way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Katie is already in a state of disbelief. But we're in chapter 60 of the book of Isaiah. That old saying, a smile will go a mile, so you ought to try that, right? <laughs> Put it on and wear it. It'll be a blessing to those around about you. Our time is growing nigh to a close as far as our present study of the book of Isaiah. It's been a refreshing thing to me. As I said before, you have endured it very well, and I appreciate that. And the key to the book of Isaiah or any other Bible book, number one key, is what? Read it. Just read it. Learn how to read the Bible. Someone says, I just read it. But you know you don't read the Bible just any old way. You sit down and you read it to see what it's actually saying. And if you'll do that, you'll find the Bible is such a delightful book to read and that the language in it is, is, is extremely pleasant and unique and helpful. After all, it has the most superior author <laughs> You know, you're not going to find a better source from which to find your wording and things. and That's our God in heaven. And so that's the key too. And read the general content of the book in which we're studying and you'll find it's a great blessing to us. Isaiah was a great prophet of God. We're going to begin our class of prayer and get back in and talk about his words to the people of Judah. In Jesus' name we pray just a minute, okay? Dear God, look down upon us in your kindness and mercy. Be with us and bless us as we open your book once again to study your word. Our prayer is that you'll be with us and bless us and strengthen us, O oh God, and give us the great courage to stand forthwith for your cause. Pray that you'll be kind unto us and those of our neighbors round about us, that your word would be acceptable in their hearts and they might become followers of the Lord Jesus Christ in this earth. Help us to be an encouragement to those round about us. Help us, O oh God, always to do that which is right in your sight above all else. And bless us this day, this hour, as we have come to study your word once again is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. The latter part of the book of Isaiah really has to do with the great blessings which God looks toward his uh, spiritual kingdom, the Lord's church, if you will, in this day and age. If you go back and look at chapters 58 and 59 in the book, we find the people that Isaiah is instructed to speak to and he uh, gives the exhortation. We find the people basically morally and spiritually bankrupt. That's the state of the nation in Isaiah's day when he lived and served the Lord in the southern part of the nation there in Judah. And uh, it's going to be another hundred years for at least many of these things which I, as I speak of, so, is going to take place pointing toward the eventual destruction of the nation under the hands of the Babylonians. But there's hope which is in the land, and that hope is going to be not just uh, in that. Those events which God set up and designed to bring that nation to its knees, if you will, were designed for their blessing, for their help. Only by and through that great discipline that God would bring upon them would they come to realize that the Lord, He is God. And as we have noted in various places in the book of Isaiah, that particular point is sort of repeated time and time again. The people might know that He is the Lord God. And that there is none other beside him. Like the Lord said to the Israelites, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And there is, those are not empty words. Those are the basic foundational criteria in which we have our relationship to the Lord God of heaven. No means zero. No other gods before me. And so chapter 458 and 59, here are those who were professing, they were professing faithfulness to God, but they were not, their actions didn't measure up to what their professions were. And so we talked about last week how the religion basically was hypocritical in that it pretended to be that which would be pleasing to God, but in fact it was not pleasing to God. Basically it was set up and designed to please whom? Themselves, wasn't it? And so it was pleasing to them there. And uh, so Isaiah is given the task of pointing out and actually enumerating the transgressions of the people of Israel in chapters 58 and 59. Well, but getting down to the end of chapter 59, last couple of verses are sort of a turning, sort of, there is a turning point as he's addressing these people. God is not pointing out the nation's sins just so that they can, you know, have their sins. Well, he's pointing them out because they need to come to a knowledge of, to recognize of them, as Brother Roger said, they need to take responsibility for their actions and what they're doing 
and turn back toward God and have the courage to stand up and do what God would have them to do. And so that general thesis runs throughout the Bible, if you will. Let's get down to the last two verses in chapter 59, if you will. It said, verse 20, and the Redeemer, read Messiah there, the Redeemer shall come to Zion. And so the words in chapter 60, 61, and 62 are going to be addressed basically to Zion. Not to the old physical Zion in which Jerusalem was brought, with, which the Israelites were brought back out of captivity to restore and rebuild, but this looks further on into that spiritual kingdom of our Lord, of which our Lord Jesus Christ is going to be over, the Redeemer of. And so the Redeemer shall come to Zion, and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord. And so the Redeemer is going to be the Redeemer of whom? Those who turn from what? Transgression. Well, Isaiah has pointed out rather specifically, and without any question, what their transgressions amount to in the verses just preceding them. But those who turn from them, then they're going to look in a different direction, if you will. Verse 21 says, As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord. And so here's what the Lord's covenant is My spirit that is upon thee, and my words which I have put in thy mouth shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed. Now the mouth of thy seed, seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth and forever. The key thought, once again, centers around God's Word. God's Word, which He's going to put in the mouth of His prophet Isaiah, and through Isaiah into the minds and hearts of people, that's not going to change. God's Word is what it is. It's not going to be something today and something else tomorrow. It's going to be sure and steadfast. And so in contrast to chapters 58 and 59, chapter 60 sets forth the glory of the Lord. In fact, our lesson is titled, Glorified Israel, the Beloved Nation. So you might drop down to about verse uh, 7, and we'll come back and pick it up in verse 1 in just a moment. It talks about the flocks of Kedar shall be gathered together unto thee, the rams of Nebaioth shall minister unto thee, thou shalt come up with acceptance, they shall come up with acceptance on my and I will glorify the house, uh, the house of my glory. So that God's house is going to be glorified, is the idea. And drop on down, uh, where is it? About verse uh, nine, and uh, the latter part of that verse it says, "Well, that's verse nine. Surely the isles shall wait for me, and the ships of Tarshish first. And bring thy sons from afar, their silver and their gold with them, under the name." of the Lord thy God, and to the Holy One of Israel, because He hath glorified thee." And then it speaks of His glory at least one other time in this particular chapter. So, glorified thee, talking about Zion here, talking about spiritual Zion, God is going to glorify in the process. So, here's really a remarkable chapter in that in this chapter, and really the next two chapters, 61, 60, 60, 61, and 62, there are no words of rebuke to the Israelites. None at all. And so here are verses which are going to be great encouragement to them, good news, if you will, in every particular as they go through their lives. So let's look at the first part of this chapter. Our book uh, heads it out as the glory of the Lord is risen, and the first seven verses of it, if you will. So let's look at the first three verses and get those before us. And again, just to try to put some emphasis on our. Um, uh, process of reading and seeing what it says to, you know, arise and shine. If you're told to arise and shine, what position are you in if you're told to rise? You're, where, <laughs> you're down, aren't you? And so the Lord said, you know, let's get up. Let's get up, if you will. Rise and shine. Get out of darkness is the general context of which we'll see in the process. For thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. And again, the two expressions, Thy light has come and the glory of the Lord is upon thee. Those words are what we would call parallel basically in thought as such. And so God's glory is going to come by and through the light that's going to come. Isaiah speaks as if it has already taken place, but he's prophetically looking toward the time of the Messiah when he's going to come. Zion has been in darkness and there. But now God's glory is going to shine upon her. And so that's going to be good for Zion. There will be a light in the world. And uh, God is light. The Bible says, and in Him is how much darkness? No darkness at all, isn't it? 1 John 1 and verse 5. 
In fact, the Lord said in what John 8 says, I am the light of the world. The light shineth in the darkness, he said in John chapter 3, and the, or John chapter 3, and the light, and the darkness didn't like the light. And because their deeds were evil in the process. So here's God's light that's going to be brought to the people here. And he talks about the darkness that shall cover the earth, the gross darkness of the people. Then there's that great big word, but, in verse 2. The Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. So here is God's words to his people, whom he loves, and whom he cares, and whom he uh, is making provision for them, eventually to be brought to pass in the coming of the Redeemer, or our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, if you will. They brought out of light. And here's another aspect added in verse 3, which shows that this is looking toward the days of the Messianic uh, kingdom in the process. Verse 3 Who's going to come to this light? Gentiles. And so this light, when it's come, not going to be just for his chosen people, Israel. It's going to be ready for all peoples of the world, both the Jews and the Gentiles alike, kings to the brightness of thy rising. And of thy rising, when Israel comes up and rises up, if you will, and receives the blessings of God's glory by and through and in his kingdom, then that's going to open up the doors for other peoples of the world also to come to the light, if you will. Come to that great center of God's blessing where he says in the general context where he places his feet or where he dwells is the idea. So great things to think. The entire earth has been in darkness. Why? Um, heaven's glory is going to be revealed. It's going to be revealed through Zion. And think again not of the old physical Zion. When the Israelites came back out of captivity, the Babylonians there, they came back and under the leadership of servants like Nehemiah and Ezra and Esther also by the way who was significant in that return. Uh, they came back and they rebuilt the city of Jerusalem and the walls around Jerusalem if you will. And they were restored as a people but not in the sense in which the Lord speaks through His prophet here in Isaiah chapter 60 here. And so verse 4, Zion's children is going to come from afar. They're going to bring their wealth. Let's see what it says about it. Verse 4, Lift up thine eyes round about and see. All they gather themselves together, they come to thee. Thy son shall come from afar, and thy daughter shall be nursed at thy side. Then thou shalt see and flow together, and thine heart shall fear and be enlarged, because the abundance of the sea shall be converted unto thee. The forces of the Gentiles shall come unto thee. Verse 6, the multitudes of camels shall cover thee. The dromedaries of Midian and Ephath, all they from Sheba shall come. And they shall bring gold and incense, and they shall show forth the praises of the Lord. And verse 7 says, And all the flocks of Keter shall be gathered together unto thee. The rams of Nemoth shall minister unto thee, and they shall come up with acceptance of mine altar, and I will glorify the house of my glory. And uh, there. And if you go back and you just read, just, just read over those words, some you know those really seem difficult. It seems like, you know, what in the world is it talking about? That, but if you go back and look at actually what's said, I think we can get the idea pretty good. For example, back in verse 4, he says, you know, look, he's, talking, he's speaking to Zion. He says that these are going to gather themselves, they're going to come to these Zion. talks about their sons are going to come from what place? How far out? From far. Daughter shall be nursed at thy side. And the imagery there, and there's a lot of symbolism in this section. The imagery there is kind of like the uh, days, you know, when, when the ladies who have small children, they sometimes they carry, carry them on the hip. Uh, I, any of you ladies ever do that? <laughs> I've, seen, I've seen them do that. And they carry, you know, but they're going to be there, and they're going to be cared for, and they're going to be looked after, if you will, in the process, and there. And uh, then he talks about the idea that's going to flow together, and their heart shall fear, the idea of fear, your heart's going to be one which is going to have deep reverence, respect for really the things God. Be enlarged, it's going to be uh, not in a detrimental way, but it's going to be because of the increase of the people. It's on, their heart's going to be enlarged. Then he talks about the abundance of the sea. I wonder what in the world he's talking about, about the abundance of the sea. 
Go back and read the general context. What do you think it might be? Next line, next phrase. Gentile nature, Brother Rick, I think so. And again, you have the idea of the structure of the language when you read it there. And the abundance of the sea shall be covered, and the forces of the Gentiles shall come unto thee. The forces, the numbers, the people. As you have the general structure of, of the Old Testament, especially when you have the parallel. And so if you learn to pick those things, look at them, and you'll find the phrase, what in the world is he talking about, the abundance of the sea? There have been various ideas, but the context would be, as Brother Rick says, he's talking about the people. The word sea oftentimes has reference to the multitudes of the people on earth in which we live. And uh, like in Revelation 20, the sea shall give up the dead which are in it. And so, and so perhaps more than just the watery graves, but of the masses of people in the idea. So, but let's see. And so they're all going to be coming to Zion. That's different than just one people or one nation coming to Zion. And then it talks about rather interesting, 6 and 7 talks about camels and dromedaries and places like Midian and Epheth and Sheba. They're going to come and they're going to bring their wealth with them. Well, in the world, what if you have the picture? The picture is you've got people from camels and dromedaries. You have pictures of what? All people coming from all parts. And so you have, you know, methods of transportation in that day and age. I guess we'd say automobiles and trains and airplanes in our day and age. And so they're coming from various parts of the world. So it's not just going to be a local, not just a local process of restoration of Zion, but it's going to be a worldwide, I guess would be one way of putting it in the process. So peoples, the Gentile people as well as Jewish people, they're going to be coming. And when they're coming, they're going to bring all their wealth with them. What about this idea of Midian and Epiph? Midian and Epiph, uh, if you go back and read, I believe it's in Genesis 25, you thought they were grandsons of Abraham through Petura. His wife after Sarah died. And so there's Abraham's descendant. And you go down to Sheba, you look at some grandchildren through uh, Ishmael, Hagar. And so it's kind of interesting. You have the idea of people coming into this glorious, glorified Zion, if you will. And you're going to have Hagar. <laughs> And Isaac's people brought together once again. That's, that's a, I think, a wonderful thought in reality. Well, even, even those who at one time are, went their separate ways, but they're brought back together in this great way. In other words, people are going to be coming from whatever it is. That's basically, if you didn't know anything else about uh, these places, about Midian and Epiph and about Sheba, and if you didn't know anything else about them, just by the process of reading, you could see that here are events which are taking place from various ways in the earth of that day and age. In the, on the world. And so just that would help the flocks of Kedar, which would be another place, the, the uh, rams of Nebaioth, and uh, these also I think are probably descendants of uh, Ishmael. You could go back and check on that too. And they'll minister unto thee. They'll be servants in Zion's glorification as such. So here are those who are one time distant both physically as well as spiritually from Israel, but now they're going to come together in God's Zion, and what they bring with them is going to be accepted upon mine altar, he says. In other words, their worship will be accepted to God the same as Israel's worship. And he's not talking about animal sacrifices in the context here. He's simply talking about the fact that here is a place recognized as that which would indicate their worship unto God. So that would be a good thing to do. And I will glorify the house of whose glory? My glory. God is to be glorified. To God be the glory in the church. The New Testament says in Ephesians 3 and about verse 20, I believe. And God is going to glorify his house. His house in context is Zion. Well, somebody raised the question in verse 8 and 9 here. It says, Who are these that fly as a cloud? And as a dove to the windows. In verse 9 it says, Surely the isles shall wait for me, and the ships of Tarshish first, to bring thy sons from afar, and their silver and their gold with thee, unto the name of the Lord thy God, and to the Holy One of Israel, because he hath glorified thee. Well, what's he talking about once again? If you continue on in thought, going back to verses 4 and 5 and 6 and 7, the thought really just continues on down through 8 and 9 about the various places from which people are going to be coming to God's house, to His Zion, if you will, in days though. They fly as a cloud and as a dove to the windows. Well, what's the imagery there? 
Some, some describe this as well. Kind of reminds you of the white sh sails on the ships which are coming from afar, bringing that way. And, uh, but you know, just, just the clouds have the way. Clouds generally come from what direction? West to east? Is that still the case over in that part of the world? <laughs> I guess it is. And it talks about that, and it talks about as doves to their windows. And doves, it's their, it's their habit. You know, they'll fly off, and then they, what? They'll come back. The picture seems to be simply that which is coming back together again to that one place, which is to be their place, if you will. Flocks of Kedar, uh, rams of Nebal, and uh, they're going to minister to you in the process. It talks about ships of Tarshish first. What, tell me about Tarshish. What, modern day's time, we would probably identify that as what country? Spain, yeah. But the picture simply be, in the general context, where well, they're going to be coming from the far western parts, over here in these other places, and mid and they're over here in the far eastern parts. And in my oath, that's kind of up north and to the east up there. So in other words, they're going to be coming from all directions and all places. They're going to be coming into God's Zion, spiritual Zion. How much better picture could you have than that which takes place when the Gospel of Christ went forth in the first century days? Basically, that's what takes place, and still is to take place in our day and age, if you will. And the Isles, we've encountered that word Isles before, and generally thought the Isles is used, when you're talking about the Isles, what, generally what are you talking about? The, the people, the people of the lands, you know, and such, so the Isles, and that you have the sea, and you have the Isles, and so the people are going to come, and uh, they're going to come in good numbers, if you will. And what about the idea that they're going to bring with them? What is they're going to bring with them here somewhere I read here? Their silver and their gold and that, huh? Yes, yeah. What's bringing silver and gold having anything to do with coming to Zion? Mm hmm. Do what? That's, I think that's the general idea, Dan. It's going to be built it up. But the idea is simply when those from all over anywhere when they come to Zion, to God and to His glory, what part of it are they going to bring with them that belongs to them? Everything. And so what wealth or riches they may have, these are matters which now are those things which simply belong to our Lord God and will be available for use to God's glory as such in the world. Not unlike many in our day and age who have been blessed in, uh, in uh, physical ways and financial ways and good faithful brothers and sisters in Christ and they'll use their wealth, if you will, and to God's glory and to advance the cause of Christ throughout the world in which we live. So, good things to think about in the process. So, Zion, that will be a good thing to look forward to. Now then, go back and pick up, and uh, our lesson text says, well, to pick up about verse 8, but we kind of included 8 and 9 with the first part of this uh, study guide. I thought it might fit better there. And go down and pick up again about verse 10 here in the process in there. And it talks about in verse 10, the sons of strangers shall build up the walls, and their king shall minister unto thee. For, reason, in my wrath I smote thee, but in my favor have I had mercy on thee. And so at one time there were those uh, who were once destroyed by foreigners and the walls of Jerusalem were destroyed by foreigners, if you will. And But now we have those who are building up the walls of Zion. That would be spiritual Zion. And so those who were once destructive toward God's people are now part of them and they're building up and strengthening seems to be the ideas. So the sons of strangers shall build up thy walls. And when you talk about the sons of strangers, if you pick up that phrase and just go back and tie the thought into these various places in uh, about verse uh, 5, 6, 7, and 8, and 9, these, well those are places where they were strangers at least to the nation of Israel. And so the sons of strangers, the people from these lands, if you will, non-Jewish lands, they're going to build up thy walls, and their king shall minister unto thee. And he says, In my wrath I smote thee, having reference to what event? Captivity. But he said, In mercy 
My what have you, uh, my favor is bestowed upon thee. God says, yes, I disciplined thee, I smote thee because of your evil ways, your moral and spiritual bankruptness, if you will. But I've had mercy on you, and that's going to be obtained eventually through the coming of Messiah, the process there. So, uh, good things to think about in the process for the nation of Israel as Isaiah, God's prophet, is writing on them and giving them some hopes in the things if, in the life in which they would live. Turn with me over to the book of Revelation for just a moment. There's, to me, there's a lot of similarity in uh, Revelation 21, 20, and 21, latter part of 20 and first chapter 21, to the general thought we find in Isaiah chapter 60. Isaiah chapter 60 gives great hope and emphasis and teaching relative to God's coming Zion. New Jerusalem, if you will. In Revelation 21, God says, I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from heaven uh, from God as a bride adorned for a husband. And on down toward the end of that chapter, when he's talking about the various aspects of that great spiritual city, which is going to be there, and verse 23, for example, said, The city had no need for the sun, we're going to find that in chapter 60, neither for the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did light it did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. Remember the light in Isaiah 60. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. And so you have the people, you have even the kings of the earth. And many at least whom are going to be subservient to it. In verse 26, and they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it, and there shall, verse 27, there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. And so this great city, this, this city which God is picturing of Zion, when it comes forth, is going to be a great and wonderful event in the life of the people there. Great things to think about. Let's go back to chapter 60, down about verse 10 and pick up. We'll read down through about verse 14, if you would please. Verse 14, The sons of strangers shall build up thy walls, Zion. Their king shall minister unto thee. For in my wrath I smote thee, but in my favor have I mercy on thee. Therefore, verse 11, the gates shall, thy gate shall be open how? Continually. Not going to be closed gates. Beautiful gates, by the way, described in Revelation 21 2 of the heavenly city. They shall not be shut day or night, that men may bring unto thee the forces and the multitudes, numbers of the Gentiles, that their kings may be brought. And so here's ever open gates, if you will. Verse 12 For the nation and kingdom that will not serve thee shall what? perish. Yea, those nations shall be utterly wasted. Verse 13, the glory of Lebanon uh, shall come unto thee, the fir tree, the pine tree, and the box together. Two, for what purpose? Verse 13, to beautify the place of my sanctuary, and I will make the place of my feet glorious. And while you're there in that place, just note the parallel again. These uh, trees, these shrubbery, these great things here are for the purpose to beautify what? God's sanctuary. Not speaking of a literal process, but speaking symbolically there. And he says, I'll make the place of my feet glorious. Well, what is the place of God's feet? It would be his sanctuary, wouldn't it? And put to the mind of the Israelite, of course, they go back to the Old Testament temple and the sanctuary there. But in reference to the new Zion, it's going to be the Lord's church in reality. That's where God's feet is going to, that's where his dwelling place is going to be. And I will dwell they shall be, I shall be their God, and they shall be my people, and I am going to dwell with them forever. So they're great things, if you will. Verse 14, The sons also of them that afflicted thee shall come bending unto thee, and all they that despise thee shall bow themselves down at the soles of thy feet, and they shall call thee the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. And so this identifies specific to whom the prophet is addressing here in chapter 60, those who will be called the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. And so here's God's spiritual 
nation, I guess would be one way of putting it. Foreigners, verse 10, uh, as we said, Babylon was destroyed, O Zion. Now they're going to be coming and helping build up the spiritual walls of the city and uh, going to restore it. And this is going to be as a result of God's mercy or His favor, which He extended to the people. And so time and again we've seen through our study in the book of Isaiah where God pointed out the utter destruction which is going to take upon those who live in disobedience to Him. He said, but there's the hope. He always holds out the hope for those who would hear and become obedient and follow His ways. And his ways are not man's ways, he said back in chapter 55. His thoughts are not man's thoughts. So God needs us to hear His ways. So uh, gates are going to be open continuously, He says in 11 and 12. And the Gentiles and kings who once were kept out, the purpose of the gates was to keep them out. Now they're going to be invited in. Yes, sir. And remember back in the days of Nehemiah, part of his great work was to restore the wall and the gates. That they might keep the enemy out. And those who were inside the wall and inside the gates, those who were considered to be in a safe place, in that day. Well, spiritually speaking, those who are inside the walls of God's spiritual city, whose gates are open, inviting everybody else, and they no longer live in a state of war and conflict and such, but now they're going to be living in a state of peace where all people can come and be part of that great event. It's really, really, I think, a wonderful thing that Isaiah is pointing out to the people here in this particular place. And so, let me see if I can. Find my place once again, if you will. And uh, verse uh, glory of Lebanon, he talks about in thirteen. He talks about the various trees, fir tree, pine tree, and the purpose of these is not to physically reconstruct the temple because that's where these timbers originally came from in Lebanon to help construct the temple. But this is a place, he uh, says, of my feet. He says, it's going to be uh, that which is going to be beautified. Beautified. So the imagery is that where God's uh, glory is going to be a very beautiful place. The Lord's church is a very beautiful place and to be. Sons who afflicted and come now, uh, those who afflicted God's people Israel, they'll now come. And when it says, bending, uh, this, uh, unto thee, not that they're going to come and bend down and worship it will the Israelites as such, but to Zion. The thee there is Zion. And so they're going to come with a heart, a contrite heart and spirit, if you will, of submission, humility. And they're going to bow down to God's way and be a part of God's holy, uh, divine city, city, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel here. And those who afflicted it, they'll come and do that. They'll call thee the city of the Lord. And so here is that which Isaiah says, You know, in your future, Judah, who is now living in total disobedience almost to God, things will be brought to pass where you'll have a city, you have a place to live. Not like the old Jerusalem in the days of old, but it's going to be a great and glorious city. For in God will be glorified therein, and He'll provide everything that's needed for mankind. And they'll no longer, you know, what did He say back in chapter 2? They beat their plowshares into, you know, they're going to be a people of peace once again. Let me see how that wording is back in chapter 2 of Isaiah there. So, uh -huh. Let's see if I can even find it. Elizon shall go forth the law, rebuke many, beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks, verse 4, chapter 2. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And so the wars, the battles which we fight now as God's holy city is on, is a spiritual war. We don't go back to carnal warfare and take up our literal swords and things like that. But those things now we are have peace with God. Someone says, we live in a world where a lot of people are God's people are not necessarily experiencing peace. Well, that's true in the sense that we sometimes have to favor, have to face affliction and 
even persecution. But those who are at peace with God, then whatever comes our way, we are at peace. We don't have to worry about it. The Lord's church is not going to take arms against any people on the earth in which we live, except we will take one piece of weapon. That's called the sword of the Spirit, Ephesians chapter 6. And we'll take that sword of the Spirit, which is God's Word, which is going to be into every mind and every thought, as he describes it even here in chapter 60 or such. And that's the, that's the tool, if you will, that's the weapon that's to be taken. And uh, the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And we'll take that. And that has the power. And uh, what did Paul say about the gospel? It's the power of God unto what? Salvation. And so here's a city wherein people live, and it's a city of salvation. In fact, the walls, I think, are so called as such. So let's read on, if you will. Verse 15. Uh, Zion had been forsaken in the past, been forsaken and hated, and no man went through thee. Verse 15. Verse 15. I will make thee an eternal. Excellency, a joy of many generations. Old Jerusalem was a city which was totally destroyed. Nobody really would go through it or live in it at that time. And so, but I'm going to make this Zion, God's going to make his Zion, he says, an eternal excellency. And it's going to be a joy for many generations. And so here is Zion pictured. It's going to be a place where people will be. And it'd be a place of great joy and strength, if you will. Verse 2016 talks about sustenance. Thou shalt suck the milk of the Gentiles, shall suck the breast of kings. Thou shalt know that I, the Lord, am thy what? Savior and thy Redeemer. And again, the mighty one of Jacob. Know that God is the Savior and the Redeemer. Isaiah, God of my salvation, is it word Isaiah? If you will, so suck. And the idea is that there, as the mother feeds and provides for the child, then God is going to feed and provide for those who are His. And uh, He's going to be our, and we are totally, completely dependent, if you will, upon our God of heaven. So He's going to have some things that's going to be changed. You make a comparison in verse 17, talks about brass, and He's going to bring gold for brass and, and silver for iron in verse 17. And, Brass for wood and stone, iron for stones. And, and so he says in the latter part of verse 17, I'll also make thy officers peace and thine exactors righteousness. And so things are going to be better in the spiritual zone than it was in the old zone. It's going to be better. And the comparison here, the, the symbolism seems to be that which is going to show that is the better. Come to the book of Hebrews. One of the great words uh, in the book of Hebrews is the word what? better. I think at least some 13 times in that book you'll find the word better. And the idea in that book is the idea of a comparison between the way of Christ, which is spiritual Zion, and the ways of the old covenant under which the Israelites live. And God's message, it's going to be a better life. It's a better way. And it has a way. Here is that the, uh, which has eternal consequences, if you will. And not just temporary, but it's going to be of an eternal state in there, in the, in thine righteousness. And so, violence is not going to be heard anymore in your land, wasting or, nor destruction within thy borders, for thou shalt call thy walls what? Salvation in thy gates and praise. And so, in Zion, brought in by the Redeemer, as such, that spiritual Zion, We'll be living behind the walls of salvation and the gates of praise. And so, here are the gates which are open, and the idea is bringing praise to God and to His way of our being upon this earth. Very beautiful, I think, symbolism to show. The walls of salvation, the wall is that which is designed, of course, for the protective care of the individuals who live within inside that wall. But here are those who live in the, within the walls of salvation. God looks after and cares and provides for them in a great and wonderful way. Those who are going to be uh, officers of peace, I don't know the indicating any specific individuals, but those who have areas, I think, of responsibilities and carrying out those things, not going to be through the process of oppression or threats or that sort of thing. It's going to be through the process of peace and encouragement and exhortation 
and helping, you know, caring one for another and looking after one for another. Violence will not be a part of the way of life, that's so, because we'll be behind those walls of salvation. What about 19? It goes on down there a little bit further, verses 19 on down. The Lord's going to be everlasting light, and we, uh, we kind of ran that section a little bit into that one, but that's, I think, where we need to go with it. And verse 21, it says, The people also shall be all what kind of people? Righteous. They shall inherit the land, how long? Forever. The branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I may be glorified. Let's go back and practice the reading aspect for just a moment. Here's God's people. What kind of people are going to be in that great holy city of Zion? Righteous people. Not like those described in chapters 58 and 59. There will be righteous people there. And uh, talk about the idea of uh, won't need the sun or the moon anymore. Does that mean we can just get rid of the sun and moon in a physical way? No, that's not the idea. The idea is simply this. The sun and the moon is that which provides light for us on this physical earth in which we live. And uh, so we're going to have another light. And this light's going to be an everlasting light. And what, what, the, what is that light going to be? God, isn't it, Sister Shakar? God is going to be our light. If we, and again, going back to Revelation 21, while we read from, read from a few moments, we have pretty much that same imagery of the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from heaven. Days of thy mourning shall be ended. Hmm. Shall be in the days of thy mourning shall be ended. M O U R N I N G. And so, why would they be mourning? Without that light, without that wall of salvation, without that beautiful environment where God's dwelling place is, where He puts His feet, but it says life just just not very good. Days of mourning, but now in those walls, in that light, there is no mourning. It kind of reminds me of Paul's statement in Philippians: Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. That doesn't mean that there will never be any sadness because there is and are and will be because of very, why, why do we have sadness in the world today, by the way? Some people say everything ought to be where there's just no sadness, no heartache. If God, if why, why do we have sadness and heartache and things of that nature? Sin. Do what? Sin. Sin is one reason. Sure. Yeah. Well, that's a good observation. Carla said, you know, if everybody had everything all right 100% all the time, people would be thinking it's not themselves. But the bottom line is, if we don't have the ability to sorrow and the ability to hurt, how, would that, how does that relate to our ability to love and to care? Because we have to deal with sorrow and things. That helps us build our concept of love and care and concern, doesn't it? But if there's nothing about which to be concerned about, we're not going to have any concern. And so God's arrangement overall is absolutely wonderful, if you will, in the process. Zion had been forsaken in the past. She's now going to be an eternal excellence, a place of beautiful adornment, if you will. And go on down about verse uh, 20, 19, if you will, and where it talks about the sun will be the light. Verse 20 talks about the idea the sun shall no more go down, going to be everlasting light. And then in verses 21 and 22, the citizens are going to be righteous citizens. They're going to be governed by God's law. The people also shall be all righteous, inherit the land forever. And the idea is that they inherit the land forever. It's not going to be taken from them. Now in the Old Testament days, the nation of Israel, the physical nation went in and they inherited the land of Canaan, didn't they? And of Palestine, yes sir. Eventually that land was taken from them. Now they were restored back to it, but they never had back to the state that it once had with it in the process. But here is that city of Zion, which is not going to be taken with it. It'll always be there. And uh, talks about what, what the, um, uh, talks about, I'll build my church, and you know the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Here's that which is going to be built substantially, where it's not going to be taken away from God's people. So your life and God's kingdom and His church and His service is that which is going to be secure 
as such. And the only way you're going to be, not, be, be denied that is if we make the foolish choice of turning away from it. Then talks about a little one should become a thousand, a small one a strong nation. How the Lord will hasten it in his time. It means it's Galatians 4, in the fullness of time, God set forth his son, made of woman, made under the law, if you will. And so that which seems to be little, if you will, and the I, you know, the size basically has nothing basically to do with our service to God. Little becomes like a thousand. You know, you can take a little bit and a great, great deal can be done with that. And so uh, process. And so God can take a little, make a lot out of it, if we'll let him do it, if you will, in the hands. And so you can take uh, a small one, make a strong nation out of it. Point being, God is the one who has control over the destiny of the nations. And so we ought to learn it. Question, comment. Let's look at our questions then. What about number one? What did Isaiah say to come to the people? Light. Let there be light. And, uh, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon these. Said, Who did Isaiah said would, said would say would come to them? Who's that? Gentiles. Gentiles and their kings. Verse number three. What did the people, what do people who come to God bring with them? Everything. They bring their sons and their daughters. They bring their wealth. They bring everything with them. And uh, we sing a song sometimes, I surrender all. And that's the case. We bring it all. When would the gates of Zion be opened? Number four. All the time, continually. Number five, what would Zion be called? Number 14. City of the Lord. The Zion of the Holy One of Israel. He's making reference prophetically to the Lord's church. The Lord's church is the city of the Lord. And uh, what did God promise to make Zion in verse 15? Yeah, a joy, an eternal excellency, a joy, many generations. And so not just this generation, but many generations. Number seven, why would Zion no longer need sun or moon? God is going to be their sun and their moon, their light, and thy God will be their glory. And so God is our glory. Finally, number eight, when did God promise to bring these things about? In his time, didn't it? In man's time? No, but in God's time. Any got a question, comment? I'm going to give you all A plus today. Nobody threw anything at the teacher. That's good. Way to go, Katie. <laughs> Just wait, she said. <laughs> Let's close with prayer. Thank you, O oh God, for your love for us and for the great, wonderful city which you allow us to live behind your walls of salvation. Bless us as your servants and take us, dear God, as though any of us live seem like in a small way, but you can take us and use us to your glory. And that is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Learn to read the Bible, brethren. She's fine, and she's, her mama's got her off up in the country this morning. I reckon she'll probably be here tonight, Katie. But, yeah, she's...